Good morning. Before our service continues, I'll note that our diocesan intern, Elaine Tola, cannot be here today, so I'll be preaching instead. Our service continues on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. Because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. reading from the book of Hosea. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities, it consumes their oracle priests, and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? 
how can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and no mortal. The Holy One in your midst. And I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord who roars like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from, Assyria, from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. A reading from a letter of Paul to the church in Colossus. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient, these are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now 
you must get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. The word of the Lord. Please stand as you're able and join me in singing our gradual hymn, hymn number 510. Any children who'd like to participate in our children's sermon time are welcome to follow our chapel volunteer out the side door immediately following the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the God who loves us, Creator, Redeemer, and Life Giving Spirit, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I recently happened upon an interesting article published in the Atlantic magazine entitled, Meaning is Healthier Than Happiness. Meaning is Healthier Than Happiness. The article reports on a psychology study that dug into what happiness really means to people. And it specifically explored the difference between a meaningful life and a happy life. According to the article's author, it seems strange that there would be a difference at all. But the researchers of this study, who looked at a large sample of people over a month-long period, found that happiness is most often associated with selfish taking behavior, and that having a sense of meaning in life is most often associated with selfless, giving behavior. Happiness, therefore, was defined by the study's participants as feeling good. And the researchers measured happiness by asking subjects questions like, how often do you feel happy? How often do you feel interested in life? And how often do you feel satisfied? The more strongly people endorsed these measures of hedonistic well-being or pleasure, the higher they scored on the happiness scale, whereas meaning was defined as an orientation to something bigger than the self, measured by asking questions like, how often do you feel that your life has a sense of direction or meaning to it? How often do you feel that you have something to contribute to society? And how often do you feel that you belong to a community or social group? And the more people endorsed these measures, the more meaning they felt in life. So according to the authors of this study, happiness, perhaps surprisingly, characterizes a relatively shallow, self-absorbed, or even selfish life, in which things go well, needs and desire are easily satisfied, and difficult or taxing entanglements are avoided. If anything, then, pure happiness is linked to not helping others in need, they concluded. So while being happy is about feeling good, meaning is derived instead from contributing to others or to society in a bigger way. As one of the researchers ultimately said, partly what we do as human beings is take care of others, and contribute to others. And this makes life meaningful, but it does not necessarily make us happy. And this difference between a life of happiness and a life of meaning is what I believe Jesus is getting at in this morning's Gospel reading from Luke. When he tells us this parable of a rich man who builds ever bigger barns in which to store all of his material goods, thinking that this will ultimately make him happy. But as the parable continues, God looks down upon this man and says to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. In other words, contrary to what many in our society might tell us, the endless accumulation of wealth and the pursuit of more and more stuff, more and more material goods, will never satisfy us, however much we may have. For the pursuit of such things, because they are fleeting, will never satiate our desire.
for more and more and more, all in the hopes that happiness is just around the corner. This is folly. This is folly. Because if we go down this road, Jesus warns, there will be no end to our anxiety. For the day will come when we'll end up like the man or woman who stares at a fridge full of food and feels starved. We're at a bank account full of money and feels impoverished. We're at a house full of things and feels empty. Jesus tells us today that if we follow the example of this rich man, making idols out of our possessions in the same way that the Israelites are depicted as worshiping false gods in our reading from Hosea, if we do that, then we'll never really be at peace. Because at the end of the day, what matters most in life is not leading a life of happiness, but leading a life of meaning, a life in which we are rich toward God, meaning a life lived in service of God and of God's kingdom and in service of our neighbor, a life in which we strive to borrow an image from our reading from Colossians to clothe ourselves in Christ. For though we may feel happy or self-satisfied one day and not the next, if we live a life of meaning, storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven, as Luke puts it, we will thrive regardless of the circumstances. And we will remain grounded enough to take each day as it comes, trusting in the love of God to carry us safely through to the day's end without getting overly caught up in the regrets of our past or in our plans for the future, which is also folly. For at any moment, our life might be demanded of us, which does not simply speak of the possibility of our death, but also of the possibility of a radical change in our life as we have come to know it such as the loss of a loved one, or the loss of a job, or a phys physical disability or ailment that impinges upon our capacity to live the kind of life we've grown accustomed to. At any moment, our gospel points out today, our life might change in ways we could have never imagined, which might confront us with new challenges, and at times make happiness difficult to come by. And yet, even amid such circumstances, even then, a life of meaning is still possible. And herein lies the good news at the heart of today's gospel reading, that God in Christ loves us, that God loves us as Hosea describes it like a parent loves their child, and therefore wants each of us to thrive by placing our trust not in the fleeting things of this world, but in the eternal changelessness of God, in the vision of God's kingdom that Jesus lays out for us in the Gospels, which necessarily takes our focus away from our own ego and away, therefore, from the anxieties that can lead to a sense of scarcity from the anxieties that can lead us to forget about the abundant blessings that we continually receive from God, and that therefore can lead us to foolishly seek our security, like the rich man, in the accumulation of things. For as Jesus tells his disciples immediately after the gospel passage we hear today, as Jesus tells these disciples of his, who in most cases were dirt-poor day laborers, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? 
If then you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying, for it is the nations of the world that strive after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. But instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Living a meaningful life in the pursuit of God's kingdom, a life focused not on ourselves but on God and others, will not necessarily mean that we will be happy each and every day or that our lives will be without difficulty or hardship. But a life lived in this way does mean that we will be provided with the gift of God's peace, which surpasses all our understanding. A peace that the world cannot give, but that only comes to us when we place our trust, place the whole of ourselves in the love of God and in the blessed vision of God's kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. May we, with God's help, do just that. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed as found on page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of The Prayers of the People, Form 6, on page 392 of the Book of Common Prayer. Page 392. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, and for those who are alone. 
for this community, the nation, and the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Catherine, our presiding bishop, Michael, Chip, and Anne, the bishops of our diocese, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God and His Church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we remember today the Diocese of Pretoria in South Africa. In our own diocese, we remember the Church of the Epiphany, Rocky Mount, the Church of the Good Shepherd, Rocky Mount, and St. Andrew's, Rocky Mount. And in our own parish, we pray for Holy Comforter's exploratory team who leaves tomorrow for a five-day trip to North Carolina's Companion Diocese of the Episcopal Church of Costa Rica. Shannon McQueen, Tom Lambeth, Morgan Kernodal, and Adam Shoemaker. And we pray for the success of this long-term Galilean initiative goal of developing a sister parish relationship with a faith community in that part of the world. We remember today all people involved in conflict and war, especially Mark McLaughlin, Joshua Trumbull, and Chris Strawn, and all others who have requested our prayers. For Jamie Adams, Ken Stonebreaker, Bill Holmes, Frank Harris, Anne Ingram, Anne Duke, Dave Forsyth, John Peloso, Jean Greiner, Martin Shaw, Alma Winfrey, Jacqueline O'Donnell, Fred Heckman, Buster Brown, Pat Boyd, Jackie Connor, Carl and Rebecca Coley, Sam Jones Moore, Rod Reinecke, Jean O'Connor, Sean Toom, John Tola, Mildred Nowell, Tyson Swain, Alan Champion, Jim Carr, Matthew Strong, Tom Shaw, all residents of rehabilitation and assisted living facilities and their caregivers, and anyone else you wish to name, either silently or aloud. Hear us, Lord. We also thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life and especially for the ministry of our assistant rector, Marissa Thompson, who celebrated her first anniversary with us this past week. And for anything else you wish to name, either silently or aloud. We will exalt you, O God our King, And we pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Remembering especially today, all those who died this past week in service to our country. Nicholas B. Burley. Stephen M. New. Eric T. Lawson. Karen E. Nuve. 
Rob L. Nichols, Jonam Russell, Stephen M. Smith, and anyone else you wish to name, either silently or aloud. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Put their trust in you. And now, kneeling as you are able, we pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. Through your compassion, forgive us our sins. Now and under, may God be blessed by God. And so, Holy Father, Spirit, that we may live as we are to you in the newness of life. In the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite forward Tom Lambeth, Shannon McQueen, and Morgan Kernodal, who, as mentioned in the prayers, uh, will be traveling with me tomorrow to the Episcopal Church of Costa Rica, our diocese's uh, companion uh, diocese, with the aim of trying to uh, come back uh, being able to identify a faith community that we can partner with uh, in the years to come. And hopefully this is the beginning of, uh, of other trips from Holy Comforter uh, to, uh, to Costa Rica, and perhaps at some point we can receive uh, members from that part of the world to work and worship with us uh, here in Burlington. And we traveled down uh, with 16 uh, comfort dolls uh, that have been made specifically for this trip uh, that we'll be uh, handing out uh, along the way. About uh, this time, Marissa is away sick today, so I've asked uh, Martha uh, Stewart to uh, please uh, pray our commissioning prayer over us. So let us pray. O oh God, we praise you for the redemption of the world through the death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. We thank you for pouring out your Spirit upon us, making some apostles some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip your people for the building up of the body of Christ. Bless Adam, Shannon, Tom, and Morgan, and bless this new work that we undertake, that your name may be glorified now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. 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 Peace with you. Peace. Thank you. Peace with you. Peace. Peace, Sarah. Peace. Peace. Peace, David. Peace. Thank you. Peace. 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 Yep. Please be seated. Well, good morning again uh, to one and all, and welcome. Uh, our uh, typical lemonade on the lawn immediately following this service has been moved down uh, to the Great Hall uh, today um, because we have a presentation uh, on the proposed elevator to open up accessibility to all three uh, floors of the church. Uh, and to that end, I'd like to invite Julie Swanner uh, to speak to that for a moment. Good morning. I'm Julie Swanner. I am assistant treasurer and chair of the finance committee. And I wanted to share with you this morning why I support our plans for the elevator. I must admit, I was on the fence for a very long time until, until recently. And I want to share with you three things um, that influenced 
my decision to become supportive and really enthusiastic and excited about these plans. The first of which is, I'm a little embarrassed to admit, but until recently, I was under the false impression that our church is accessible. We have a ramp, right? People can come in, if they can, you're in a wheelchair or a walker, have trouble getting in. But I started talking to people who have accessibility problems, mobility problems, and hearing about how difficult it is for them to navigate our church. And while, yes, they may be able to enter the sanctuary and may be enter, able to enter the Great Hall, being a really active participant in our church is very, very difficult for them. And I also heard from the ushers about how many people have trouble with stairs here. Not just those who are in wheelchairs, but many of us, many of us throughout our lives will suffer a disability at some point, whether it be you know, a boot on the foot or recovering from surgery. Most of us are fortunate enough that this is temporary, but we're not all that fortunate. So I started noticing how many people have trouble navigating the stairs here and have a little trouble getting around or on crutches or have a boot or recovering. And I started realizing how many people were impacted. And keep in mind that the third story of our church is completely inaccessible right now to anyone who cannot navigate stairs. The second factor that influenced my change of heart was when Adam talked about his vision for our future. And I heard about a play school and a third, an alternative worship service. And I thought about how wonderful it would be for us to be able to fully utilize our beautiful auditorium. And if we had an elevator, we could do that. And then the third factor is, because of my need to be fiscally responsible, um, I, feel, I feel very good at this point in the game that we have exhausted every possible option from a chair lift to a vertical lift to a commercial elevator. And with the plans we have in place now, we are offering a very practical, affordable solution. There's nothing extravagant about it. And I feel like we're being very responsible in our decision making. So why am I supporting the elevator? I want to give the gift of accessibility to everyone here, to all parts of the church. I want to invest in the future of our parish. And I can feel good that we have done our homework and that this is the best solution. So I hope you'll be able to come to the information session after this service. If not, there are some uh, information packets on the back table. Please take one. There's information about how you can make a donation, frequently asked questions, that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And I really do encourage all of you, if you can, to stay for that presentation uh, on uh, the proposed elevator, which is the same presentation uh, that the vestry heard before um, making the decision to, uh, to move forward. Finally, many thanks uh, today to our soloist, Kelly Autry, uh, who, um, for those who don't know, grew up in this church uh, for singing uh, our offertory anthem. Uh, Kelly will soon return to uh, Baldwin Wallace University just outside Cleveland, is that right, for his uh, sophomore year. With that, we continue our worship with the offering of our gifts. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
continues with Eucharistic Prayer C, found on page 369 of the prayer book. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, they were created and have their being. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the stewards of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood he reconciled us, by his wounds we are healed. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord God, of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so, Father, we have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit. Now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, Do this for for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers and mothers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for all of us, the people of God. This is God's table, and all are welcome here.
Turning to page 365, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Let us go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks to God.